They say that life is better in colour. In the world around us, colour offers diversity, richness, new perspective. The same is true in particle physics. Just as black and white pictures were enriched by the full colour broadcast, relativistic gauge theories were enriched by the phenomenon of colour. Quantum electrodynamics, the relativistic gauge theory of electrodynamic interactions, developed by Richard Feynman, Julian Schwinger, and Sin Itaro Tamaga, was the prototype particle physics gauge theory. Subsequent attempts to develop theoretical frameworks for the other forces of nature have all built on its groundwork. And just as the cathode ray tube television required one black and white phosphor to be replaced by three coloured phosphors to offer new perspectives on the world around us, quantum chromodynamics, the relativistic gauge theory of strong interactions between quarks, required the introduction of colour charge to offer the very same. Particle physicists love to throw around abstract terms like flavour, isospin, hypercharge and colour. At first, these terms may seem like arbitrary, illusory and entirely abstract theoretical conceits. But today we will learn that colour is anything but. Colour charge in particle physics opens up a world that boasts the same variety, beauty and insight as its more openly stunning visual counterpart. So what on earth is colour charge? Well, it helps to first consider a concept with which we're all far more familiar, electric charge. In quantum electrodynamics, electromagnetic interactions are mediated by the exchange of photons between charged particles. We say that the photon couples particles with charge. Particles only interact with one another electromagnetically if they carry the source of electromagnetic interactions, electric charge. Similarly charged particles repel, while oppositely charged particles attract. However, neutral particles with zero charge do not interact electromagnetically. Charge is conserved in all electromagnetic interactions. The charge before the interaction is the same as the charge after the interaction. The source of the interaction persists. Now consider the humble proton. The proton consists of two positively charged up quarks and a negatively charged down quark. So why don't these similarly charged up quarks repel one another and fly apart? It stands to reason that there must be another interaction between quarks that beats out the electrostatic interaction at short distances and binds quarks together inside hadrons like protons. That interaction is the strong interaction. And just as the electromagnetic interaction requires a source, electrostatic charge, the strong interaction also requires a source, color charge. Quarks carry a charge known as color. And in quantum chromodynamics, the gauge theory underlying strong interactions interact with one another via the exchange of colored gluons. No other particles carry color charge, so gluons do not couple to any other particles. Only quarks feel the strong interaction. Color is conserved in all strong interactions. The color before the interaction is the same as the color after the interaction. The source of the interaction persists. So at first glance, quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics look very similar. However, there is a hugely impactful difference between electrostatic charge and color charge. Charged particles like electrons carry only one type of charge, negative. Quarks, on the other hand, can carry three different types, red, green, and blue. Antiparticles like anti-electrons, positrons, carry only positive charge, while antiquarks can carry three different anti-charges, anti-red, anti-green, and anti-blue. Note that color charge has nothing to do with the visual concept of color. A red quark isn't painted red. A green quark isn't painted green. Color charge is a current property 
of a quark, and could just as well have been called anus, Venus, and Cenus. However, the terminology of colour has a particularly beautiful feature. It suggests a wonderfully simple characterization of the quark combinations that are found in nature. Namely, all naturally occurring particles are colourless. Any baryon composed of three quarks, such as a proton or neutron, must, at any moment, contain one red quark with one unit of red colour charge, one green quark with one unit of green colour charge, and one blue quark with one unit of blue colour charge. By analogy with conventional colours, red plus green plus blue equals white, a neutral colour with a net colour charge of zero. Similarly, the quark-antiquark -quark pairs that constitute a meson must have the opposite colour charge to each other. Red plus anti-red, cyan, makes white, which again produces a net colour charge of zero. So this explains why the stock Wikipedia picture of a proton has one quark of each of the three different colours. However, for the moment, we've simply defined the concept of colour charge into existence. Why do we need these colour charges? And why do we invoke them? Where do they come from? And perhaps more importantly, are they real? These are very legitimate questions. So let's start with the first two. When did the concept of colour charge arise? And why did we need it? To answer those questions, we need to understand why the concept of quarks was so at odds with the theoretical insights of Wolfgang Pauli. Before the concept of colour as the source of a strong field was developed into the theory of quantum chromodynamics by physicists such as Harold Frisch, Heinrich Luttweiler and Murray Gelman in 1973, colour provided a theoretical loophole. The period of 1947 to 1960 saw an explosion of strange hadrons discovered in emulsion films exposed to cosmic radiation and in the debris of collisions at the first modern particle accelerator, the Brookhaven Cosmotron, switched on in 1952. The deltas, the sigmas, the lambdas, the xis, and more found their way into the list of known and ostensibly fundamental particles of nature. The number of new particles in the elementary particle zoo was getting out of hand. Classification was required we needed a periodic table of elementary particles. In 1964, Murray Gelman and George Weig postulated that all hadrons are in fact composed of even more elementary constituents known as quarks. Spin one half particles with fractional charges that bind together in different combinations to form the periodic table of hadrons we observe. However, despite this model neatly explaining the existence of related groups of new hadrons, it suffered from two glaring theoretical problems. Firstly, no one had ever seen a free, fractionally charged quark. And secondly, quarks appeared to violate the Pauli exclusion principle. Consider the combinations of three up quarks, three down quarks, or three strange quarks that form the corners of a group of related hadrons known as the baryon decaplet. These hadrons, known as the delta minus, delta plus plus, and omega minus, are combinations of three down quarks, three up quarks, and three strange quarks, respectively. Now quarks are spin one half particles, known as fermions, and as such, they have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle states that no two identical fermions can occupy the same quantum state at the same place and at the same time. Or stated another way, no two identical fermions can have the same set of quantum numbers. It's the principle that explains why electrons pair up with anti-aligned spins in atomic orbitals. So if no two identical fermions can share the same set of quantum numbers, how can three identical quarks possibly bind together in the same state to create a delta minus a delta plus plus, or an omega minus hadron. Yet by 1964, each of these hadrons had been discovered in nature. The quark model stood in open defiance of Wolfgang Pauli's exclusion principle. 
In 1964, O.W. Greenberg proposed a way out of this dilemma. He suggested that quarks carry another property, another label, another quantum number that carries at least three different values. He called this property color. He suggested that quarks not only come in different types or flavors, but can also come in at least three different colors, red, green, and blue. So with a combination of three identical quarks, each quark simply carries a different color and hence a different set of quantum numbers. The restrictions of the Pauli exclusion principle melt away and the delta minus, delta plus plus, and omega minus hadrons are perfectly permissible. This was the first evidence for the existence of the property of color charge and the fact that it carries at least three distinct values. Nowadays, the fact that color adds a new degree of freedom to hadron wave functions is essential to understanding the groupings and properties of all hadrons. However, at the time of Greenberg's bold assertion, it was perfectly reasonable to feel that the color hypothesis was a theoretician's sleight of hand. The introduction of a novel label that conveniently distinguishes between identical quarks and subverts the restrictions of the Pauli exclusion principle. And that's how it was viewed by many in the late 60s and early 70s, as the last gasp of a quark model creaking under the weight of its own flaws. So how can we get beyond assertion and convenience and actually prove that color exists and takes exactly three distinct values? There are a couple of realizations that make the experimental verification of color difficult and at first glance, potentially impossible. Notice that while photons have no electric charge, gluons do carry color charge. To ensure color is conserved in any strong interaction, gluons carry one unit of color charge and one unit of anti-color charge. This means that when quarks interact via the strong interaction, their colors change. As Professor Matt Strassler beautifully summarizes, a quark is a bit like a light bulb that's always on, but which flickers rapidly and unpredictably between red, green, and blue. This makes it impossible to observe a quark's color, since as the quark interacts via the strong force, its color changes. Color is not an intrinsic property of the quark. Contrast this with the electric charge of electrons, which never changes, and is an intrinsic property of the particle. That property is far more easy to nail down and measure using magnetic fields. Worse than the changing nature of a particle's color is the fact that quarks are always confined within hadrons, combinations of particles whose total color is zero. We can never isolate a quark and try to examine it carefully. They are stuck inside colorless objects. By contrast, although atoms have zero electric charge, we can separate an electron from an atom and study it in isolation. So if we can't observe an individual isolated quark with a definite color, then how can we be certain that color even exists? And how can we nail down how many colors there are? Well, fortunately, we don't have to measure the instantaneous color of a given quark to nail down color. In the modern era, there are many ways to show that the existence of exactly three colors feeds into theoretical quantum chromodynamics predictions that align beautifully with experimental data. Firstly, electron-positron collisions at a high energy collider like LEP provide direct evidence for both the existence of color and the number of distinct values it can take. LEP, the Large Electron-Positron Collider, ran from 1989 to 2000 at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. When electrons and positrons are smashed together, they annihilate to form a high energy photon, or Z boson, which can then produce different final products, including a muon anti muon pair or a quark anti quark pair that produces jets of hadrons as the quarks separate. If we neglect the mass of the final state muons or quarks, an approximation that's very reasonable at high energy, the only theoretical differences between these processes are one, the charges of the final state particles. Muons and antimuons have a charge magnitude of one, whereas quarks have fractional charges, plus two thirds for up, charm, and top quarks, 
and minus one third for down, strange, and bottom quarks. The larger the magnitude of the charge of a particle, the stronger the photon couples to it, and the more likely that end state is to be produced. And two, quarks and antiquarks have three colors, while muons and antimuons have only one. Muon and antimuon pairs do not have color and can only be produced in one way. However, quarks and antiquarks come in three colors, and hence the photon is three times as likely to produce a quark-antiquark -quark pair than a muon-antimuon pair. Now consider the ratio of the number of hadrons produced in E plus E minus collisions to the number of muon-antimuon pairs. If the photon only produced up-anti-up -up quark pairs, the ratio R should be the charge of the up quark, two thirds, squared, and then multiplied by the number of colors, three. That makes 12 divided by nine, or one and a third. However, the photon doesn't only produce up-anti-up -up quark pairs. It can also produce down-anti-down -down quark pairs, strange-anti-strange -strange quark pairs, and any other quark-antiquark -quark pairs that have a combined rest mass lower than the beam energy of our collider. Experimentally, it's impossible to tell the difference between the jets of hadrons produced by different quark-antiquark -quark pairs, so all collisions that produce jets of hadrons are lumped in one box. Then the R ratio becomes a sum over all quark flavors that are accessible at the beam energy of the collider. What this means is that as we increase the energy of our collisions and more quark-antiquark -quark pairings become kinematically accessible, we expect the R ratio to show steps that follow our theoretical prediction. At low energies, only the lightest up, down and strange quarks can be produced, and the ratio R takes the value of 2. As we increase the energy of our collider, the charm quark becomes accessible, and more quark-antiquark -quark pairs can be produced over muon-antimuon pairs, and the R ratio jumps to 3 and a third. These steps should continue as the beam energy rises and the bottom and top quarks become accessible. This is exactly what we see. These theoretical predictions match exactly what we see in data, allowing for the impact of resonances. As such, these data provide incredibly strong evidence, not only for the existence of color, but for the existence of exactly three colors. Another set of processes that betray the existence and spectrum of color charge are Drell-Yan processes. The Drell-Yan process is an electromagnetic effect first theoretically studied by Sidney Drell and Young Mao Yan in 1970. In a Drell-Yan process, a quark and antiquark from a pair of interacting hadrons annihilate to form a photon that then produces a lepton-antilepton pair. Drell-Yan processes occur in high-energy proton-proton collisions at machines like the Large Hadron Collider, and the characteristic spectrum of Drell-Yan processes was even used in the early operation of the machine to dial in its performance. Notice that while the quarks and antiquarks that annihilate to create the photon carry color, the photon itself does not. What that means is that the quark and antiquark that annihilate to form the photon must have exactly opposite color charges. Red anti-red, green anti-green, or blue anti-blue. Zero color has to come in because zero color is going out with the photon and color charge is conserved. This constraint on the color of the quarks that can interact suppresses the likelihood of a Drell-Yan process occurring by a factor of one over the number of colors in nature squared. When we look at experimental data, the number of Drell-Yan interactions during hadron-hadron collisions can only be adequately explained if this color suppression factor of one over nine is taken into account. Again, Drell-Yan processes provide incredibly strong evidence, not only for the existence of color, but for the existence of exactly three colors. There are many more experimental measurements that can indirectly illuminate the existence of color and the spectrum it takes. The branching ratios of the W boson, scattering rates during proton-proton collisions, 
and many more. So numerous experimental observations can give us confidence that color exists and comes in exactly three types. In modern particle physics, the theory of quantum chromodynamics is built on the very notion that there are exactly three colors in nature and that the strong interaction treats all quark colors the same. Or, in gauge theory jargon, is invariant to rotations in an abstract color space. Quantum chromodynamics builds on the symmetry of nature to make a myriad of precise theoretical predictions in high energy regimes. Time and time again, quantum chromodynamics, based on the assumption of three colors, describes experimental data with exquisite precision. It explains the composition of related hadron families, the production rates and angular distributions of hadron jets produced at experiments like the Large Hadron Collider, the production rates of the Higgs boson due to gluon-gluon fusion. It also provides explanations for quark confinement and asymptotic freedom. Quantum chromodynamics provides our best understanding of the strong interaction to date, and it all depends on the existence of a three-valued symmetry of nature, colour. So we now see that colour charge is not just particle physics hocus pocus, not just an ad hoc addition, not just a theoretical sleight of hand to save the ailing quark model. Theoretical quantum chromodynamics calculations provide stunning agreements with experimental data in the regimes where such calculations are possible. And quantum chromodynamics is built on the very fact that exactly three colours exist in nature. The strong interaction that binds quarks together in the protons and neutrons of which we are made relies on that very same fact. Without colour, the universe would be a very different place, and we likely wouldn't be here to ask why. You can't see the wind, but you know that it's there from the effects it has on the world around us. The same is true of colour and our very universe. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.